Chapter 4 covers developing predictive and analytical models. And we're going to look at some best practices on how to structure your spreadsheets as well as approach the project of creating a useful model. The first topic is models, models, models. We're going to see many models in the course of this course, but also it's just part of the major toolkit and skill set in the FPNA department. And then we're going to look at best practices followed by an example. So models are an essential tool for FPNA. In bold here are the ones that we're going to be touching upon in this course, revenue models. We're doing this as part of what we need to do for an operating budget. Operating budgets are plenty of work, but the one single toughest one to do is the revenue projection. You can't really rely totally on history. You don't want to rely only on guesstimates into the future. So how can we create revenue models, not only for accuracy, but also be able to convey to management the key assumptions and the risks embedded in the model. Second group would be operating plans and budgets. These would include the revenues, of course, but go through all the other cost items. The key outputs of the operating budgets are a cash budget to make sure that we have adequate cash to make it through the seasonality and natural ups and downs of cash flow during the year, and also to generate the standard financial statements so we could use those in our planning process and also the input into our accounting systems. Next, we'll look at forecasts and revisions. These are just some core abilities that we'll have to look at how do we modify and monitor during the year so we don't wait to the end of the year and say, oh, we blew it. How can we measure monthly or quarterly and as necessary, make adjustments and somehow break the news to the financial analyst community, particularly hard if it's bad news. Then we'll move to capital investment decisions, which could be for hard assets, such as building a manufacturing plant, or it could be an expansion, a new product, a new market, or it could be the fund R&D. You can imagine pharmaceutical companies have a large amount of their investments in R&D for new drug discovery. And finally, if there's a merger that's being contemplated, there's going to be an integration plan, which requires some very specific and sensitive financial projections. Finally, we serve to support the long run strategy and planning for the company as a whole. And these would include financial and non-financial measures. We might also set the guideposts on indicators, early indicators, leading and lagging indicators to know that we're heading in the right direction in line with the, the future goals of the company. Valuation is part of that long run planning. We'll, we may use valuation models to test what would happen if certain strategies are employed and if successful, what would that lead to in terms of market value and market capitalization. We won't touch much on the final two. I just put them here for completeness. Cash flow and liquidity, a large part of the business of a company is to make sure cash is adequate. This is usually conducted in the treasury department but they will rely on other departments to provide them input on how things are looking. So FB&A will support that role in cash flow projections for the Treasury Department. And in M&A, as discussed, we won't cover the entire process of M&As, such as the screening of potential targets or due diligence during the investigations or the integration plan and rollout and implementation of those plans. Here are some steps, 12 steps to be exact, on best practices. I must admit, do as I say, not do as I do, because I am usually very impatient. And over, over the years, I've made a lot of mistakes. So my reason for putting this up and explaining the steps as a best practice is that I haven't employed them and have paid the price. So learn from my mistakes. Be thoughtful about it. Be professional about it. And in the end, better things will, will come. First, in terms of accuracy, credibility, probability of accomplishment, and just the career development of being a professional that's able to predict the future. We know that's difficult. But we start with the clear objectives and we end with outputs and presentations to senior management, perhaps all the way up to the board, depending on the nature of the model. We'll go through each of these 12 in turn. So first are clear objectives. What is the objective? What is the decision you're trying to make? Is it revenue growth, profit growth, cash flow growth, all of the above? And are there targets that we need to be aware of? So before we subject it to scrutiny and approval, we can have certain checkoffs to see if it's meeting certain financial or strategic goals that are set forth by senior management. Who are the users? We may want to serve them and understand their needs fully before we embark in designing a large model. What are the key inputs? 
Sometimes the key inputs are at an intermediate stage, a subcomponent, but key inputs may go back in time, back further into the process. So we should articulate what those points are and gather the information for the model. Then what are the variables? What can go right or wrong? Some of these may be out of our control, and yet they're variables that have impact on the model. It could be a market price. We don't set the market price. We wish we could. It also could be the market demand. We may or may not know the market demand. So there may be variables that are key to the model, which are outside of our direct control. Then what are the uncertainty and risk? And if possible, bound high and low estimates. If we're gathering these along the way, we'll better be able to inform management of not only the expected case, but what are some of the ranges of possible outcomes given what we know about the model and its vulnerabilities. What is the time horizon? Are we doing a one-year projection, five, 10, what is it? That obviously has important bearing on the gathering of assumptions and also the design of the model. And finally, what is the frequency of use? Is this a one and done, or is this something we're gonna use every month as part of our normal management process? So these are basic questions that unless you ask it up front, you may be caught flat-footed later on and say, oh, I wish I knew that. Second is architect your spreadsheet. We tend to jump in and start designing things and keying things into the cells, but let's, let's be organized about it. Let's have a very clear section with inputs that is separated from the rest. So anyone picking up the model, even if you're not there, to see where the inputs belong. Second is there may be intermediate results. For example, if the goal is to maximize earnings per share, it would be nice to have stopping points like total revenue, net income, number of shares outstanding, so we might design it with an objective in mind, but there may be key intermediate stopping points that will be part of the testing of the accuracy of the project and also the information that will be needed or desired by senior management. Then what does the output look like? Are they graphs? Are they tables? This would be a good thing to do to architect the data so it's conducive to easy processing into the final form. And there might be tables. There might be tables that match other work done by other departments, so we might as well follow their formats. There may be some, some constraints for accounting systems. So if this is going to become a standard report coming out of our financial systems, we should design with that in mind. Why move to things that are difficult if we can have the flexibility to design it in the most conducive way up front? And graphs. Graphs are sometimes done at the end once you see the clear indications, but there are some graphs that we know we're gonna wanna look at. So we might as well articulate those so we have agreement up front and we set those aside until the results are in. The third step is to document. Often we scramble, we get data, we put it in the model, but we don't take the time to gather the documents by way of internal information. There could be reports, there could be information, other studies, other models that we rely upon for this model. There might be external resources that give us data or some validity to some of the assumptions that we're making. And we seek to improve the quality of the input and assumptions. So as we document and capture them, we'll know where the rough spots are. And let's say there are 10 assumptions and you're just going to make sure you make it through one pass. You might know one is particularly a weak assumption and you mark that so later on as time permits, you'll go back and refine and get perhaps a better source for that weak point in your data gathering. Next is to have credibility. One of the reasons for documentation is to have senior people or reviewers see the extent of the work and the validity of, of your assumptions. And it also has accountability. If you relied upon certain inputs from other departments and people, as we see the models unfold and they don't come as predicted, we would know exactly what happened. Not by way of being punitive, but we should know where the numbers fell short and why. And finally, there would be some future research and refinements because again, we'll know the parts of our model that are vulnerable and we might have something like, I wish we had blank. We'll capture that because in time, that blank may become possible. So capture those thoughts as you go. The fourth step is to, as mentioned, have a very clear input area. It may seem obvious, but a lot of models just have a variable as you're coding it, oh, I need this. And you put it in either hard code it or just insert it somewhere in the middle of the model. Resist that temptation and ha stick to a discipline of having a defined input area. You could have it as you go, find a variable you didn't capture earlier. Just remember that variable should belong in the input area. And you may want to clearly define or limit the types of input into the cells. 
And this would avoid typos or database searches that don't come up with null results because someone had the wrong terminology. So things like pull-down menus for standardized information might be helpful as well, or validation tests to make sure the data is right. These are refinements that you wouldn't do first pass, but as you move this into regular use, particularly in, in the hands of others, you may want to add that level of polish and precision. And avoid at all costs what we call hard coding, where you're in the heart of a cell coding a formula and you're inputting an assumption. Don't do that because something's gonna get loose. That assumption will change or at least be bear, bearing some scrutiny. So that should be delineated outside. So all references inside of a formula should be to either a number that cannot change like pi, pi doesn't change, but anything else that can change should be isolated in an input area or intermediate result area. So these are just basic hygiene, if you will, for Excel. Number five is document, again, the key assumptions and drivers. It shows that you understand what are the economics of the model that you're building. And you may have shortcuts where you're approximating or estimating and document those. Because again, in time, you may go deeper and find better methods to get at the same key intermediate result. So watch out to make sure that there are constraints that you know. There may be constraints that you self-impose. For example, you might say, oh, the, the market in the United States is blank. Well, just with that statement, you've now limited the market to the United States. So if you have key assumptions, document them again, so that they can be reviewed and revisited as the time comes for a global expansion. And one of the things we're always trying to capture in the model is the economics. And we don't have precision on how to have what is the input, what is the output. We're approximating what are the key drivers that provide us some inputs that can approximate what will happen in the future. And that could be refined. We see this all the time when we create regression models where we say, oh, let's do a linear regression. Then we say, oh, there, it doesn't really have high explanatory value. So you look for some other variables that have additional insight, which in combination give us a better overall projection. That's how we go from a simple linear regression to one with three variables, two independent, one dependent, and we move to multiple uh, variables as independent variables. So all this can be developed over time as we critique and refine our models. Sixth is to make sure you start with historical data. You can be sure someone looking at this model will say, what happened for the last five years? And you should have that as a point of clarity and credibility. It's not that the past will predict the future at all. It has some bearing, it has some relevance. So you need to have it in order to then go from there into what you believe will happen in the future. And that's an area that you can be sure will be scrutinized. How many years would you need? Well, it depends like every model, but generally you like to have three to five years of data because you can then get past any anomalies or outliers and you're starting to see more of a historical pattern.